Tom Copeland is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been called to teach God's Word on finances since 1982. Tom is a chartered professional accountant who has advised thousands of people, including individuals, couples, and business owners in making wise biblical financial decisions. Tom's Financial Moments are aired on numerous radio and TV stations across Canada. Tom is the president and founder of Copeland Financial Ministries, who teach what the Bible says on finances. For more info, check out copelandfinancialministries.org. Again, copelandfinancialministries.org. Now, here is Tom teaching and explaining how you can discern God's will in managing money through your relationship with Christ. I'd like to welcome you to session three on the topic, developing a close relationship with God. This is the third session out of eight sessions on the overall series titled, Discerning God's Will and Managing Your Money Through Your Relationship with Christ. So um, this is uh, session three, and we're going to focus in on how you can develop a close relationship with God. Here's the key biblical principle. In order to discern God's will in managing money or any important decision, there is no substitute for developing and maintaining a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A close relationship with God enables you to discern exactly what God wants you to do, and this is particularly important when there are several options within the biblical guidelines. In Hosea 14.9 it says, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them. If you remember in Genesis chapter 41, only Joseph could interpret Pharaoh's dream. Joseph did not do this on his own, but rather Joseph was able to discern the meaning of the dream because of his close relationship with the Lord. After interpreting the dream, Joseph said, Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. As a result of that close relationship with God, Joseph uh, was put in charge of all of Egypt, second only to uh, Pharaoh. Um, just, just amazing uh, what God did. And remember, Joseph was actually in jail prior to this, uh, on, convicted of a crime that he didn't commit. So God did amazing things here and, um, in revealing to Joseph the dream. And a jo God may not reveal to you a particular dream, although he can speak to you through dreams, that's possible. More often than not, he tends to speak through his word and his spirit. But the, the point is this, Joseph had a close relationship with the Lord, and that's how Joseph was able to do what, what he did. If you remember in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon asked for a discerning heart. And God answered, I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. And so God gave Solomon an incredible discerning heart. Remember, he wrote the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what Solomon asked for, and he gave it to him. And I believe that uh, God can do the same for us. You may not write the book of Proverbs, of course, but he can give you a discerning heart. And in tough decisions, in tough situations, or important decisions, everyone needs to discern God's specific will for them in their particular situation. And that can only be achieved through a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what I'm going to talk about now, is developing and maintaining a close personal relationship with the Lord. Jesus said, My Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself. Now this is Christ speaking. The Son, He can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. It's amazing that Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, depended upon God the Father in order to discern what He should do while He, while he was here on earth, and to discern and, and understand complex situations. He did exactly what God wanted him to do, and we should do the same. So because of Jesus' close relationship with God the Father, he could sense where the Father was working, in particular with these scriptures, and Jesus would follow the Father's lead, and we need to follow the Father's lead. Similarly, God wants us to have a close personal relationship with Him so we can discern God's specific will, which is God's best, rather than making a financial or other decision based upon our own judgment. Jesus, in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And when Jesus talks about knowing his sheep and, uh, and the sheep knowing him, he's referring to a close 
uh, intimate and personal relationship between Jesus Christ and those people who have accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord. And so I can say this, uh, once you've developed a close personal relationship with the Lord, you will be able to hear God's voice. Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me. Or some versions say, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. Um, you may not hear God's voice audibly, but He can speak to you through His Word. Psalms 119 and 105, He can speak to you through His Spirit. He can speak to your heart. He can speak to your mind. He can give you a peace or lack of peace. He can speak to you through a, a counselor, a biblical counselor. God can speak to us in so many ways. And I like what Dr. Charles Stanley says, Our intimacy with God, His highest priority for our lives, determines the impact of our lives. And this is life principle number one from uh, Dr. Stanley's Life Principles Bible. The bottom line is, our intimacy with God, which is, should be our highest priority, is going to determine the eternal impact of our lives. And this affects all areas of our lives, including how you manage money and major any important financial decision that you make. Developing a close relationship with the Lord and um, discerning God's specific will, it's, it's, it's more than just making financial decisions within biblical guidelines. I've seen many cases where Christians take the approach that as long as they manage money within God's financial principles, then even when there are several options within those biblical guidelines, they believe they can make the final decision without discerning God's specific will, but just asking God to stop them. And uh, this mindset of making financial decisions and asking God to stop you if it's not His will, what that does, unfortunately, is it removes the necessity of developing a close personal relationship with the Lord. And, and having that close relationship is so vital in managing money God's way and in making every important decision in life, and in particular, discerning God's specific will before you make any important decision, financial or otherwise. So staying within the biblical guidelines is okay, but it may not be God's best. It might not be God's best. Further, if you make major decisions without consulting God, then you will not likely receive God's best, which is God's desire for all of us. He loves us, He cares for us, and He wants us to have His best. And further, if you make an important financial decision without consulting the Lord, uh, it could be a bad decision that could cause problems later, or it could be a decision that represents second, third, or fourth best. There is no substitute for discerning God's specific will so that you can enjoy God's best. That's, that's what we want to do. And as, as it says in 1 Kings 22, Joseph had said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. So I'd like to uh, list some suggestions. And why don't you think about this? List some, think of about what are some suggestions to develop your personal relationship with God. And if you can, provide a reference to Scripture. So think about that for a minute. Some, some ideas to develop your personal relationship with the Lord. And... Um, Provide a reference, reference to Scripture if you can. Here's some ideas that I had. I actually had uh, 10 of them in total. One, habitually spend quality time with the Lord in prayer, reading His Word, and allowing God through His Word and His Spirit to speak to your heart and your mind. God's Word is powerful. In 2 Timothy 3, it says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Um, it's so important. Number two, be still before the Lord, Psalms 46.10, and listen to what God has to say to you. Psalms 85.8, it says, I will listen to what the Lord will say. Number three, use a spiritual journal and document what the Lord is saying to you. Um, I think of Habakkuk 2.2, where it talks about writing it down. When God talks to you, write it down. Why? Because look for consistency in your, in your spiritual journal before you make a final decision. I find for decades now, as I pray and I document in my own journal what I think the Lord is saying, there's going to be consistency. And once I've seen it there for a few months, I know that's what God wants me to do. Number four, an obvious one, but I think it's important, but it, and, uh, is uh, to regularly attend a Bible-believing church, learning more about God's Word and how you can develop a close relationship with Christ. Number five, during difficult times, if you're going through some difficult times right now on finances or other things, um, really focus on the Lord. And remember, God is in control, Psalms 103.19, and God has a plan and a purpose in every trial that He, lie, that he allows in the lives of a believer. I think of 1 Peter 1.6 where it says, These trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine. You know, it's easy to say, I believe in God and I believe the Bible and I'm going to follow God wholeheartedly when everything's going fine, but when the bottom drops out and you're having all kinds of financial problems or other problems, that's a real test of your faith. And that's going to be, it needs to be proven genuine. You need to continue to trust the Lord, focus on His Word, focus on what God wants you to do, discern His will, 
And if you do that, God will bless you uh, eventually here on earth, but certainly uh, in eternity as well. Number six, ask other committed Christians for ideas on how they develop their relationship with the Lord. Um, that's a good one. Number seven, meet with God somewhere where there are no distractions. Remember in Luke chapter 5, it says that, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I mean, Jesus often withdrew on his own, and he prayed in order to discern the will of, uh, of God the Father. Number eight, when you sense direction from the Lord, ask God to confirm it for you through Scripture and through biblical counsel. Psalms 1-1 says, Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. So we need to seek uh, biblical counsel from uh, godly financial advisors. Number nine, depending on God, cast your anxiety upon Him because He cares for you. Uh, 1 Peter 5-7. But when, when we're under stress, cast your anxiety upon the Lord. God cares for us. And, and then focus on God rather than the problems. Anxieties can easily distract you from hearing the Lord. Number 10, as will be discussed uh, later, be patient and wait for God to direct you. Remember, God is in control, and God's timing may be different than yours. Remember Isaiah 64, 4, God acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. So sometimes we need to wait. Sometimes when we pray, God's answer could be yes, it can be no, but remember, often it can be wait. Number 11, ask God to reveal to you the truth of a particular situation. I love Jeremiah 3, 33, 3, which I've claimed often, where it says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. In other words, there may be some factors. Let's say you're about to make a financial decision on buying a car or a house or some other decision. There may be something that you haven't considered. So just call upon the Lord and ask Him to show you those, those hidden things, those unsearchable things. Um, that you need to know in order to make a decision that's in accordance with God's specific will. And number 12, don't try to figure out things on your own, but be open to God's wisdom and direction, as only the Lord knows everything, including the future. Only God knows the future, we don't. So uh, don't try to figure it out all on your own. Obviously, you're going to use the intelligence God has given you and do all the, the financial planning, developing a budget and that kind of stuff. But um, be, be open to God's wisdom and direction. Number 13, ask God what you should pray. I, I like uh, 1 John chapter 5 where it says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of Him. So we need to discern from God what we should pray. And Romans 8, 26, 27 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. And it's very appropriate to pray and ask God through His Spirit to intercede for us and also to reveal to us what God's, what God's will is. And the, the last thing I'd say, number 14, is persevere. Developing a close relationship with the Lord takes time, but the long-term benefits both here on earth are, are well worth it. Um, there's eternal benefits to discerning and uh, following God's will God's specific will for your life in, in all areas of life, including managing the money that the Lord has entrusted to you. Here's the first case study dealing with a relationship with God. Jack and Jill were considering the purchase of a home. They had learned and implemented God's financial principles in managing money, and they acknowledged God's ownership. They paid off all their debts, and they have saved a good down payment. They have developed and implemented a budget and were consistently spending less than they were earning. They had godly attitudes with respect to money and material things, and after considerable prayer, studying God's word on finances, and seeking godly counsel, they concluded that it was God's will for them to purchase a house in a particular area. Jack and Jill both developed a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, so they could often sense what God was saying to them. They continued to pray and seek God's specific will, but they sensed the Lord wanted them to wait. God spoke to their heart and mind by highlighting key scriptures, Psalms 37, 7, Isaiah 64, 4. It wasn't for three years before God gave them His peace with respect to purchasing a home. During those three years of waiting upon the Lord, prices of homes in their area decreased substantially, and they had saved a significant larger down payment. They praised God because of the, the purchase price was much less than expected, and with the additional savings as they waited for God's directive, their mortgage was much less than expected, and they would be able to pay off their house, they anticipated, within 10 years. They praise the Lord for that. That's rare. They thank God for His wisdom and His specific direction. They acknowledge that only God knows the future and that only God is in control. 
Here's the question. Has God ever provided you with specific direction on a major decision which you would not have made on your own, but sometime later you could see God's blessings of obeying Him? Has that ever happened where you, you were thinking of going in one direction and instead the Lord directed you another way and you could see that God's plan was better than your plans? Has that ever happened? Now, if it hasn't, I can say this. If you develop a close relationship with the Lord, those kind, that kind of thing is going to happen. Um, and so think about that. I'd like to share my testimony. From 2002 to 2005, I had significant health issues. I saw 41 healthcare professionals. No healthcare professional could help me with my health issues. It actually ended up being just burnout. I almost sold my accounting practice, but God closed the door on that, and He spoke to me clearly, indicating that I was to continue in public accounting and use the resources of my accounting firm to teach God's Word on finances and to not just teach it in a local church, which I had been doing since 1982, but rather God may give me a credible mandate to teach his word on finances to the nation of Canada. I would have never ever come up with that if it wasn't had developed in a close relationship with the Lord. And it's during that time, that uh, time of burnout and severe health problems and chronic pain, that God used that trial to draw me into a closer relationship with him. So if you're going through a major trial, financial or otherwise, I would really encourage you to use this trial as an opportunity to draw closer to the Lord, not go away from the Lord, but draw closer to the Lord, discern what God is trying to say to you, what His purpose is. Because uh, remember in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And God taught me dependence upon Him and drew me into a closer relationship with Him. So now today, I praise God, it's 14 years later, God is doing exactly what He um, directed me to do. and. Uh, teaching God's Word on finances as my financial moments are on 75 radio stations and six TV stations across Canada. We have a number of half-hour shows. You're watching one of them right now. And I praise God because God has done these things way beyond my ability, beyond what I ever imagined. I think of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is uh, at work within us, to him be the honor and glory. And I praise God for that. So you may have a testimony as well, and uh, uh, just think about how God has directed you and how He's blessed you. Now I'd like to talk about uh, management of money and our relationship with God. Um, in Matthew 6.24, this, this is some key scriptures here. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is saying you cannot serve both God and money. It's interesting. He could have put something else in there. He could have, could have said you cannot serve both God and self or whatever. But he said you cannot serve both God and money. So God knew that uh, um, money could, could impact our relationship with him. It, could, it creates some problems for us. And that we can end up being servants to money and material things rather than serving him. It's, it's actually very easy to do. And can you think of any examples of uh, people serving uh, money and material things rather than serving God? Can you think of any examples? Think about that for a minute. Here's the ones that I had, and I don't suggest that this list is exhaustive. There's other ones, but here's some examples of people serving money rather than God. For spending more than you earn and accumulating debt resulting in financial problems, which becomes a distraction from the more important things, such as your relationship with God, your family, and uh, etc. Number two, when an individual is materialistic and consistently wanting more and more, Paul talked about this in 1 Timothy 6 where he said, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, by the way, let me stop there. Paul didn't say money was the root of all kinds of evil. He said the love of money, that ungodly attitude towards money and material things of selfishness, covetousness, greed, pride. So to carry on, Paul said the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul's saying that even Christians can have a struggle with the love of money and allow money and material things to become more important to them than their relationship with God, their spouse, their involvement in ministry, etc., the third example I'd give is excessive hard work. Where one's lifestyle is out of balance, which reduces or eliminates their daily quiet time with the Lord, and thus negatively impacts their relationship with God. Uh, it, can indicate, it can also negatively impact excessive hard work and negatively impact your relationship with your, your spouse and your kids as well. 
it can, it can hurt the family. Number four, when an individual has little or no involvement in ministry because of a focus on money and material things, then that is an indication that they are serving money and not God. If you remember in Luke chapter 12, in the parable of the rich fool, um, God blessed this, uh, it was a farmer, and God blessed this uh, man with a tremendous crop one year. And rather than looking up and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do with this surplus, uh, which obviously part of it would have been giving to the Lord's work, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and I'm going to store this all up for me. In other words, he was selfish. He put his trust in um, money and material things, and he was not rich towards God. So accumulating, accumulating, accumulating uh, material things or money can also be an indication of um, serving money rather than God. And number five, if someone gives very little to God's work because they're spending money on themselves uh, and perhaps giving God the leftovers, as I call it, rather than the first fruits, as we're indicated to give in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, then they're clearly serving money and not God. And so God wants us to put him first. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. So it's important to put God first in every aspect of your life, including... Um, including the, the area of giving. So here's a question. Can you think of any other scriptures that indicate that how we manage money impacts our relationship with God? Um, think about that. Uh, other scriptures that indicate how we manage money impacts our relationship with the Lord. I think of Luke chapter 16 where Jesus said, If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? And one of those true riches, so Christ is saying, one of those true riches is a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as a matter of fact, in Philippians uh, 3, 8, Paul said he considered a relationship with Christ to be more valuable than anything else. So, um, and uh, true riches uh, are, are so important. And Christ is saying if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, which is money, who's going to trust you with the true riches? So in other words, Christ is saying if you're not trustworthy in handling something of lesser importance, such as money and material things, which by the way are very temporary, a split second after you die you're going to realize how temporary they are, then why would God entrust you with things of eternal value, such as a close personal relationship with the Lord and an effective ministry? Why would He entrust you with, with all of that if you haven't been trustworthy with money and material things? So maybe you need to learn to be trustworthy, learn and apply God's financial principles, and manage money according to God's principles and God's specific will. And this is also consistent with 1 Timothy 3, which talks about the overseer of a church, like an elder, uh, must not be a lover of money and must manage his own family well, which includes management uh, of family finances. So uh, um, that's a requirement of a leader of a church, that they, they need to be able to manage their own family finances, um, the finances of their family well. And often this is not considered, I find, in choosing uh, church leaders, but it, it should be. So here's a question. What about the other way? Does our relationship with God impact how we manage money? Think about that. Um, does our relationship with God impact how we manage money? If we have a close relationship with the Lord as opposed to a distant relationship, will that close relationship impact how we manage money? Think about that. I think the answer is absolutely yes. Our relationship with God does impact how we manage money. Let me give you an example. An individual who does not have a close personal relationship with Christ will likely manage money the world's way. In other words, they'll likely spend more than they earn, accumulate debt causing stress, and the focus of their time and energy will be on their money problems, which actually they created by violating biblical principles. And they'll be on money problems rather than God and His work. They won't have a focus on things of eternal value. Or they could take the um, position of the rich fool. They could follow his example in Luke chapter 12 and accumulate excessively and trust in their wealth rather than God. So it can go either way. It can be someone who spends, 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 accumulates debt, or it can be someone who accumulates, accumulates, pinches all their pennies, and uh, just keeps uh, saving, saving, saving uh, way beyond what they need for retirement. And, um, and, and that can be an example as well uh, when, when someone does not have a close relationship with the Lord. But I would say this. If someone does have a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, here's what I have found over the decades, what is typical of how they manage money. First, they will be content with God's provision. 1 Timothy 6 talks about godliness with contentment is great gain. And because they're content, they'll avoid the ungodly attitudes of covetousness, selfishness, and greed. Secondly, they will pray and discern God's wisdom and God's specific direction in making financial decisions, which is so important. Third, they will study what God's Word says on finances, and as a result, they will understand and apply God's financial principles. 
Number four, they will give the first fruits of their income to God's work and God will bless them accordingly, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Number five, they will develop and implement a budget as Christ admonished us to do in the parable of the tower. And as a result, they will make financial decisions based upon their financial facts rather than personal desires or guesswork, which is what a lot of people do. So the key is this. If someone has a close personal relationship with Christ, um, they will manage money God's way and they're going to experience God's peace in the area of finances and, ex and they're, going to, they're going to be blessed by the Lord. That's, that's for sure. And I think of John 14, 27, where Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So here's the summary of this session. I hope uh, you found it, it helpful in developing your relationship with the Lord. And there's other ways to develop your relationship with the Lord uh, that I haven't mentioned. And I encourage you to, to follow them. Um, but I would encourage you to take the time to develop a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can discern exactly what God wants you to do, um, which is God's best, before you make any important financial decision. Um, a close personal relationship with Christ will enable you to discern God's specific will in non-financial areas as well. A lot of these principles apply both to the financial and to the non-financial. And here's the recommended memory verses. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. That's uh, John 5, 19. And in John 10, 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Remember, that's the personal relationship that Christ is talking about. And in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Christ is warning us that money can be a competitor in our relationship with Christ, and you don't want that to happen. You want to make your relationship with Jesus Christ your number one priority so you can experience God's peace and God's blessings while you are here on earth and also in et eternity. I'd like to now close in prayer. Father, I thank you that your word says so much about developing a close relationship with you, and I pray that everyone listening would take the time to study your word and to pray and develop a close relationship with you, Lord, so they can discern exactly what you want them to do, Lord, in making important financial decisions and in making any important decision whatsoever, Lord. I pray that you would just speak to people through your word and through your spirit uh, as they listen to this program. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To learn more, check out copelandfinancialministries.org or follow us on Facebook. Instagram or Twitter under Bible Finance.